Big thanks to Scott and Pecan Street. Uh, uh, just a fascinating project around the power of microgrids. And we're going to keep that theme going with, uh, with my dear friend, a, a great friend of Z Prime, Dr. Masood Amin, who's going to talk to us about the resiliency implications that solar and storage have uh, as, as, as it relates to the overall grid and specifically microgrids. So Dr. Amin, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Still morning in beautiful San Antonio. So I, I stand between you and lunch, so I will keep it very concise, hopefully, and brief. Uh, this whole area of decentralized, centralized, using available resources with energy efficiency, having different levels of service, must serve, good to serve, nice to serve, levels of performance that in the past, only long time ago, we were thinking about our back. And Edison's original vision of DC microgrids is interestingly back again. Why? Because of three things. Technology, wanting to improve performance at the local level. And third one is need for integration of less greenhouse gas emitting technologies. So in the next seven hours, I will share with you. <laughs> we are moving from primarily centralized to decentralized. This should be a familiar slide. But Again, I had another chart that I shared at ETS uh, Summit several years ago and again. The transition from centralized to decentralized is not a cookie cutter solution. And it's not all is going to become decentralized or all centralized. As you heard in the panel, uh, it's going to be a mix depending on what's available. De depending on cost, depending on regulation and policy, depending on the level of progressiveness of the utility and customer service that they desire. So I'm going to move around. It's a better to be a moving target than stationary. I hope you don't mind. This, this is nothing new. It has been going on for a long time. Uh, when I served as the chairman of the IEEE Smart Grid, and my hat is off, um, Dr. Damir Novosel, who was the president of IEEE PS, had a few slides that we shared for IEEE and IEEE Smart Grid. You see some of the drivers that are there. Better, better asset management, holistic asset management, not just waiting for failures. So it cost effective, if you will, and risk manage asset management. Then there are other areas within that, and look at it. This whole area of distributed energy resources, if it makes sense economically and long-term strategically, combined with transformation with the areas that you're familiar with and you heard about it, and also it's not T and D thrown in the in the thrown out with the with the baby with the bathwater, but judiciously meshing it together. So whenever we fall in our society under what we call under, uh, in logic, false dichotomy, we take extreme positions, almost religious beliefs. Is it going to be all T and D big power plants, or is it going to be all distributed? Neither one. It's going to be a mesh between the two. And that's the unfortunately mistake we make in a lot of our discourse. Not, thank goodness, in engineering, science, we have data. Actually, hopefully, we have good data. We can make good judgment on it, rather than getting into the argument and egos in that. Do you agree? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to show you some of the data in here. And then finally, enabling the future of cities, bringing cities back. So when you look at all this, this is, should be familiar to you. Do you know that the price of solar unsubsidized, unsubsidized, Solar and wind dropped below the numbers you're seeing. And this is not new. This is, this is from unsubsidized. This is from 2016, almost three years ago. Did you know that? But it depends on what? Location, location, location. And do you have transmission ability to bring it in? So it's not just that you have it at that price. Can you move the electrons? 
Then secondly, if you look at long-term curve, uh, the role of innovation in this area, material science and others, look at how much price of wind has declined, even without subsidies. These are all without subsidies. And then how much price of solar has dropped uh, from the time that President Carter started installing them on the White House to the time that uh, the energy bill kicked in, the last energy bill that we had. So the news is good. And we are learning a lot how to do them better. If you talk about maturity, ability to learn, to do better with existing technology while innovating on that technology, the, all indicators are fantastic. So when you look at it, I want to give you an example. Sometimes a wise person is an idiot in his own village. So you have to go somewhere else to kind of get the opportunity to make a positive difference, to power progress. This is from Gujarat, one of the states in India. India is like my, my uh, although I'm by birth Persian, Iranian, but I moved to New York 42 years ago. St. Louis really ends up being my hometown when I think about where is my hometown. However, India has become my spiritual home. And uh, I was in Gujarat, which is a, uh, folks in Gujarat are very entrepreneurial. How many of you know Gujarat? They are very entrepreneurial. The rest of India sometimes says they're too smart, they're, they wanna make money out of everything, but look at what they did. How many of you have seen this example of Gujarat before? This is a role of innovation, policy, and can-do attitude that they have. They had the first comprehensive policy for solar was 10 years ago. Then they had installation that they had in Gujarat. All of India was only about four times that much. And then look at this, the solar park. Of course, they always had it for rooftop hot water. They have it in Israel, they have it in Palestine, they have, they have it in Africa, South Africa, but they did it at a massive scale. I'm going to come back here making sure you guys are not texting. You see, this is my teacher professorial behavior, and you may get a gold or maroon, maroon sticker if you're be behaving and paying attention. How are you wonderful folks back here are doing? You are not ignored. I'm here. Hi, how are you doing? So anyway, look at what they did. Look at how much the improvement they made. And by the way, this re renewable energy brought them out of red. That was the initial losses and initial startup cost of investing them. And look at what they did. In a matter of eight years, look at the difference in green. These are the, these are the total turnaround in a utility in a developing part of the world that managed to bring us itself out of red. In the meantime, create a whole new workforce. In India, as you know, workforce creation, sustainable workforce is a huge challenge. You wanna lift up a society with 1.1, 1.2 billion people, that about 27% of them are still in poverty, although huge advancements have been made. But that economic empowerment, sustained long-term, the pride, the self-sufficiency is huge. And even the history of colonization, that the caste system was abolished in 1950, but still everybody knows who belongs to what caste. So here is a lesson for us about economic empowerment and community engagement right there. I won't go into the political, cultural dimension of it. So what am I doing with my team at the University of Minnesota? This is a subset related to here. These are my projects at the U of M in beautiful city of Minneapolis, the North Star State, what we call the bold north. So uh, one of them is mix and optimization of storage and renewable devices, whether it's in a state, whether it's in a region, or whether it's in a microgrid, or a collection of microgrids. And I'm going to show you that example. Morris Campus is one of the five campuses at the University of Minnesota, and it has 22 buildings, and it has a mandate since its creation to be a sustainable community. Although it doesn't have too many master's degrees, but it's ranked at one of the top colleges as an undergraduate value in the US by US 
news and world report because it's hands-on it trains you from arts and sciences to actually renewables and sustainability. It's amazing. It's on the western edge of the state, just north of Buffalo Ridge. And then prices to devices, architecture uh, that is resilient by, by design. And finally, Umore Park is the other end. It's a clean slate de uh, design. It's on the way from Minneapolis to Rochester when you go to, down to Mayo uh, Clinic. It's past a Koch Brothers refinery. And interestingly, it used to be a, a World War II weapons, I mean, a weapons development, weapons, high-end weapons, that the day it came into operation, World War II ended. So it never kicked into high production. So the university owns the land. They have put two wind turbines there that is turning all the time and providing electricity both to, to Excel Energy, and to Dakota Power. There is a lot more. This one, autonomous grid connected. This one is, did it for Sandia and Department of Defense. There was a lot of um, modes of attack. I, I'm not at liberty to go into it. There's, they were autonomous or semi-autonomous, connected or not connected. And then machine learning, AI, use of analytics, proactive, predictive resilience as part of that. And then underpinning all that, smart cities. There are other things that I have the privilege of doing in a diminished capacity, just off the record. I know we are being taped two weeks ago yesterday at a major surgery. And I'm honored, really honored to be here because I got a clean bill of health. I was released from hospital on Friday and I was with Andres and smart, at Smart Water uh, Summit in Arizona, gave a keynote on smart water and proactive resilience for smart water. And today on a completely different subject, so I'm really honored, grateful to you for giving me this opportunity. My words fall short and I'm really delighted to see you all. Uh, some of you are my old friends, know me. The other ones hopefully will become old friends. Looking forward to it. But there's a lot more going on in this area that I highlighted some of them over there at the state level. So now turning into the last second half of my presentation, talking about storage technologies. How many of you have seen a diagram like this that gives you different sources? You see, I'm agnostic. All I care about is what is the appropriate technology at the lowest cost, at a managed risk for that particular application that's going to give me the highest degree of reliability resilience performance indices. That's all I care about. So for me, as a technologist, I do care about the science, I do care about the underpinning, but I like digging into numbers what it does. So these are different modes of storage devices. How many of you have seen something like this before? Good. A handful of you. Fantastic. Electromechanical, electrical, Magnetic or, or mechanical. This mechanical is old. Pump Hydro, Raccoon Mountain in Tennessee, uh, uh, Valley Authority, or you may have seen that in other cities that do that at night and so on, and performance of them in terms of rated power versus the discharge time in hours. The other part is if you map them from my old organization, from EPRI, uh, on te in terms of size of application and in terms of which one of them has for high voltage and cost of it versus for higher value for discharge capacity. As you know, you don't want to charge discharge all the time. Even though we have used over 240 plug-in vehicles as distributed storage and reactive support in the Twin Cities area, one of my students, Sarah Mullen, who is not, has been at EPRI for about 10 years. That was her doctoral dissertation. But we are careful not to damage the battery or damage the cars. So you put these on top of layer by layer, by layer on top of another, and then it depends what you're looking for. Are you looking for energy management? You look at peak shaving, which is old from server farms, stacks of batteries like a book, uh, bookshelf libraries reliability, energy backup, power quality, or utility service. Then you look at description of each one of them. You, you see, these are all filters. You pass your decision through these filters. And I make it very systematic. These are all automated. You input the architecture 
for your, for your network. First, it looks for where is a good microgrid or what combinations of microgrids are. Then it feeds into an optimization algorithm to match it based on performance indices you have selected. So I will show you some of them. So here we assessed every imaginable technology that was pertinent that this particular customer wanted to assess from advanced lead, uh, second one, solium, uh, sodium sulfur, zinc, and vanadium, and lithium ion. We pass all these different metrics, different numbers through that, and this is for one particular application. 22 buildings, University of Minnesota Morris, on the western edge of Minnesota, north of Buffalo Ridge. Doesn't have as much wind as Buffalo Ridge. We call that part of Minnesota and Iowa, we call it Saudi Arabia of wind. So not as much, but pretty decent. So Otter Tail Power now is buying electricity from the campus, interestingly. And uh, my friends at Otter Tail Power, I love them, but they're upset with me. I was on the board of MRO <laughs> and Texas are and MRO, they complained to me, Dr. Amin, you're taking money from our operation. I said, sorry, we have a campus that students need to learn to become your workforce for the future. So that's how we do it. We turn it into a living lab that is being installed. They develop the algorithms, they do it. Another good example in the Twin Cities area is the headquarters of OATI. If you're ever in Minnesota, please go by Highway 100 and 494. There's a groovy smart grid campus called OATI. Even on July 4th, they have the flag of the United States. They have all kinds of amazing displays, but it's a self-sufficient campus. And it runs not just storage area, but it runs high-end electronics and server farms. That's how much, how much electricity they're capable of handling. So anyway, two wind turbines, the, the, you could, instead of wind, you could plug in solar. Doesn't matter. As long as you have the performance characteristics, any technologies like a Lego pieces can be thrown into the, this nonlinear stochastic optimization and simulation feedback and optimization loop again to modify it, to learn from it. And as you're running it, it's learning from it and it's improving performance. So it's not a one-shot planning, it's operational optimization. So this is the, the size of it. And commercial industrial customers here we are looking at and giving you the performance. Without storage for large commercial industrial, with storage, all loads, with storage, selected service, giving you the cost of that. And, uh, and then this is the voltage support. Using our system, voltage stays up. Even it can handle, I'm not showing you attacks on this system. We attacked it, physical attack, cyber attack, resilience to those. This, given the 22 minute time frame, I decided not to go there because I, I could talk for another 15 minutes if I go into the cyber attack. It ends up being really five microgrids, and it's all automated. Uh, Bob Galvin asked me to help with Illinois Institute of Technology, so when my former boss, Kurt Yeager, and Carl Stolkoff, and, and uh, Clark Gellings asked me to join them, this is kind of what I did for IIT and Bob Galvin way back, with Comet, by the way. So this was 2005, 2007, long time ago. So this is not new, except we have automated it in my group. Five microgrids that are, you see what's normally closed, what's normally open, and guess what? When you optimize that and you cost the outages for those organizations, look at what happens. Look at your payback period. People would think what? Renewables take a long time, right? Eight years, right? 15 years. Depends on what you're doing. Here, M5, no connection to British intelligence has, and no connection to BMW, has a high value operations. So having reliability there saves you a lot of money. In a year to a year and a half, you recover the cost. By the way, in terms of performance indices, distribution system performance indices, one remains the same 
the other two improve substantially. How much does it take for colleagues within distribution automation to do this to SADI and SAFI? Tell me. Well, you recovered the cost in less than a year and a half. It's huge, really huge. Not to oversell it. So what we learned from this is consider the whole system together. So this holistic system, everything from customers, customer needs, the real needs, not what they say the needs are, but try to gather data on that. To benefits, to cost payback, how long does it take, is it sustainable, how much money they make, all of the indices, I'm not gonna go through each one, and then, guess what? These folks who get jobs as interns, they end up being this 18 to 23, 24 year olds, end up being engineers who work and there are more women, by the way, in this area than men. Homegrown farm boys and girls from Minnesota. By the way, all colors, all colors, all good ethnicities. So this electrons are not blue, they are not red. <laughs> we all need electrons. So talk about real empowerment. And many of them come and later on do a Master of Science in Management of Technology with me, become executives 10 years down the road. And then, Make sure you engage. These are new, not new to you. Pick and Street, you heard we have distinguished colleagues from Austin Energy, from elsewhere. You have done this to the best of the best abilities. I'm very impressed, CPS Energy and others. And then at the end, I don't go through the building, but I have a whole bunch of material on attacks on buildings and networked buildings and all that, and what can you do? Your microgrid is actually the building. So. Thanks to Damir Novosel and IEEE, you have seen this before. These work synergistically, and they serve all loads at all times, or you can have priority, which ones you keep, which ones you could. The other part that we work hard, and we uh, wrote a, did a report, Julio was involved in that. I was, on behalf of IEEE, a few years ago, we gave it back then to the Secretary of Energy, uh, Ernie Muniz that we outlined, we, we outlined that, and security and resilience and replacing aging infrastructure in a cost-effective way, transitioning that, were all part of it that I had the privilege of doing. So there is more in this area. If you're interested, the part that I didn't talk about, which is get sensitive fast, is cyber and physical security and internet of things. The more building automation we put in, internet connectivity, it becomes more important. But that, I say for another day, another time. I, if you're interested, I have a few papers in Utility Fortnightly and in this, in this uh, uh, magazine, Electricity Today, on moving away from central power. It's a little bit misleading, it's not moving away, but that chart that I mentioned that has four quadrants and we are moving more and more into a hybrid between the two is really more accurate. Or how to save aging assets, not to throw that out. This takes your leadership. My hat is off to you. Thank you for coming and thank you for your engagement. And on behalf of Goldie, I extend his best regards and look forward to our collaborations. Thank you. There's a hand back there.